So today's lecture will be about the time binding model, the time binding method, which, as I have just mentioned, is a counterpart to the nearly free electron model. In fact, what we did in nearly free electron model, we started from free electron description, in which the electrons did not feel any interaction with the ions, with the crystal. And we then startly turned this interaction on by adding a weak potential. This weakness of the potential was included by taking into account only first or first few terms in the Fourier uh, expansion of the crystal potential. Today, we will go from the other side. We will come from essentially isolated atoms, means the electrons uh, do not see any other atoms, any other ions, any other core in the material. And therefore, we start from the description of electrons um, belonging to a single atom. And then we partly weaken this strong attraction to one atom so that the electrons can see also surrounding atoms, surrounding cores, by which they will start interact with the neighboring atoms and they will start forming bonds. So this is the idea. In principle, the two methods, when you're either switching on the interaction potential or when you are turning it down from over binded electrons towards, uh, uh, towards the, let's say, crystalline and uh, the localized electrons, both of these approaches should meet somewhere in the middle where the reality lies. We will start with a short uh, detour to chemistry. And um, I am not sure whether you have heard in other courses about linear combination of atomic orbitals, but uh, let's really come from this uh, chemically, chemistry uh, based method, which is very conveniently used for describing the electronic structure of molecules. Eventually, the tight binding method, as we will see, is a extension of the LCAO method. It is uh, the physics counterpart of the LCAO, which is mostly used in, in chemistry for uh, spatially localized, uh, spatial localized molecules. As I said in the introduction, the central idea here is that we try to build the wave function which describes an electron, an electronic behavior, as a combination of the orbitals, the wave functions that describe this electron when bind to a single atom. So we still work in single electron or single particle, uh, in a single particle, uh, approximation. That means we are still describing a single electron here. And we are trying to work out the wave function describing one electron. This, for example, means that the normalization that we are still using is one. Okay? This describes one electron. Um, hopefully, you are familiar with this bra and cat with the second quantization. Uh, notion. If not, then see under such symbol nothing else than an integral over the complex conjugate uh, function psi times the function psi integrated over the whole space. Right. So of course, this is the normalization condition uh, in which we know from quantum mechanics 101 that the interpretation of this quantity is something like the probability of finding an electron at position R. And of course, when we integrate it over the whole space where the electron can appear, we should get one. There is exactly one electron. So eventually this normalization condition we are using here means that we indeed work in single electron approximation. We do not consider yet any electron-electron interactions. The only interactions that we have 
are between this one electron and all positively charged ionic cores. So where the protons and in principle neutrons are located. We have a situation where there is just one proton or let's say one ionic core, so the positively charged, and then we have the one electron orbiting around. This is the most trivial spherically symmetric Schrodinger equation that we can get. We know what are the solutions of such function that the uh, that there will be a radial part of the wave function plus the angular part of the wave function, which is described by the spherical harmonic functions. I believe you have heard about this before. And eventually those together will create the single electronic orbitals that correspond to the uh, isolated atoms. And those are nothing else than the 1s orbital and 2s orbital and 2p orbitals and so on of the isolated, elect, uh, uh, isolated atoms when we are building their electronic structure. Again, I believe this is what is known from the chemistry, right? So those are now, for example, J means that we are describing the 1s electron and uh, so sorry, the phi means that we are describing the 1s orbitals and then we sum it over all ionic cores that we have. So we locate those orbitals in all of them. And we just try to construct our uh, many core wave function, the solution as a linear combination of those atomic orbitals. And the name is therefore hidden or contained the whole idea of this method. Let's try to look at the simplest possible case. And this is H2 plus molecule. That in fact means that we have two protons or two positively charged cores separated at a certain distance. And we have one electron which experiences such potential. So this is the simplest possible case after having an isolated atom. Hamiltonian that corresponds to such situation is shown here. And I do not want you necessarily to be able to write it down, but I want you to be able to describe individual terms of such Hamiltonian when you see it. You should be able to decode that this first part in the Hamiltonian corresponds to the kinetic energy of our electron. The second part, well, that is probably some electrostatic interaction, as we can see from this prefactor, which is present there when we express the whole interaction in SI units. From the charge here, we see that it's an interaction between electron and one positively charged proton, which has the charge of plus E. The electron is located at a position R and this one proton that interacts with the electron is at a coordinate RA. A labels the first proton. Similarly to that, we have the second term here, which corresponds to the other electrostatic interaction between the electron and the second core. So eventually these are all the, inter the contributions to the energy that we would write from our classical uh, physics, classical mechanics. The ionic cores are assumed to be static. They do not move, they do not have any kinetic energy. Uh, they are fixed, right? So there are no other interactions than the kinetic energy of the electron, it's not an interaction, this is energy, plus the two potential energies corresponding to the two interactions between the electron and core number one and core number two. What we do in 
LCAO method is that we now write the total or the sort uh, wave function as a linear combination of the orbitals where A is a shortcut for orbital representing, for example, the 1s orbital. So let us say we are looking for the lowest energy orbitals and the 1s orbital now centered at the position of the first core, right? So if you think about a solution of the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom, you will get a series of orbitals, so a series of solutions, which will describe 1s, and it's a function of position, right? And we would have uh, 2s, again, as a function of position, 2p as a function of position, and so on. Now, for hydrogen, we know that in the ground state, only the lowest energy state is occupied. So those orbitals, which are solutions, will be empty. And only this one, which corresponds to the lowest energy, will be occupied. This solution, this functional form, corresponds to a situation where in our coordinate system, the positively charged ionic core is located at the origin. So when we now move the origin to a position Ra, where is the positively charged uh, proton, we take the same functional form, only we now shift the coordinates such that the origin is at R minus Ra. Similarly, we take the same function, the same orbital, and shift it or sense it at the other proton, proton B, getting another function, which is this phi R minus RB. Okay. So it describes the same orbital just spatially uh, at a different location. What we are trying to do is we are looking for a solution which is simply a linear combination of those two orbitals. Right? So you do not do anything else than you say, well, for an hydrogen atom, we get that the electron orbits around it. And now we say we have this one electron, but we have two different cores. So it can be orbiting here or it can be orbiting here. And so let's take the orbit, which is somehow the linear combination of those two guys. Right? So this is the intuitive idea behind it. So when we place this form of the expected wave function of the expected solution into the Schrodinger equation that we have here, what do we get? Let's say that we have the Schrodinger equation written as Hamiltonian acting on the solution equals the energy on the wave function, right? So this is the Schrodinger equation. The Hamiltonian, uh, sorry, the, uh, the expected wave function of the solution is in this form. So we can write that this is now an Hamiltonian times CA a basis function plus CB, B basis function equals energy uh, CA, A basis function plus CB, B basis function. CA and CB are constants. These are not functions, these are constants. So really numbers in this, uh, in the, in this uh, expression. Now what we will try to do is that we multiply this by a bra function A. So what do we get on the left-hand side is that we get C as a number, we get out of the whole expansion, and then we get A Hamiltonian A plus CB. Again, we get out and we have A Hamiltonian B equals, 
And then here we have energy is a number. So we get it out of the whole expression. CA is a number. We get it out. And we have here AA plus energy CB AB. Right? And the last thing that we can do is that we now realize that the basis functions or the individual solutions for isolated atoms are normalized. That means that A, A is equal to one, similarly B, B is equal to one. one. So when we would put all of this together, sorry, excuse me one second. This is exactly what shouldn't be happening. Very impolite and I very much apologize for it. So uh, when we now uh, rewrite the last line of our equations, we get the bottom CA and then we have here the uh, A acting on Hamiltonian acting on A minus the energy. This is what we have taken from the right-hand side and put it on the left-hand side. Plus, we have here CB, and we have A Hamiltonian acting on B, minus uh, energy. Uh, right, minus energy times AB equals to zero. Fair enough. Um, the last thing what we, oh, not last thing, the next thing what we will do is that we take exactly the same formula as I had there before. We would multiply now the Schrodinger equation instead of the A basis function, we would multiply it by B, which would lead to another equation, CA, and here we would have similar terms, minus energy, and now we have BA plus CB, and here we have B Hamiltonian acting on B minus energy equals to zero. Again, here we have just the energy term, because of the normalization of the orbital. Hmm? What is this? In fact, these parts are all numbers, right? What is it? Well, Hamiltonian is an operator that we see here. A is a function. And this expression that we have here is in fact psi star Hamiltonian psi integrated over the whole volume. So that will be maybe a complex, but a number. Okay. Energy is a number. Here we have again a number, number. So what we end up with is a system of a homogeneous system of linear equations for unknowns CA and CB. When does such system have a non-trivial solution? A trivial solution is obviously that CA and CB both are equal to zero. But this is not the solution we are looking for because in such case, from here we see that phi would be equal to zero. That means that the electron does not exist. So we want to have a non-trivial solution where both CA and CB are non-zero. For homogeneous system, that means on the right-hand side, we have zeros. This is a possible or such non-trivial solution exists if the determinant that system is equal to zero. This leads to the equation 
for the unknown energy. Because in fact, we know that the energy is a number, but we don't know what is its value. Right? So the one missing equation that we have now for the whole solution, and we are looking for the coefficient CA and CB, we have the wave function, as well as we look for the energy E, the eigenvalue, the energy of our solution, uh, we are now going to obtain the third equation that we need. Finally, we do one more substitution. We will name some of those integrals, name them as Coulombic interaction or Coulombic integral, where we have the Hamiltonian acting on either A and A state or B and B state. We call them resonance integrals if we have different states on each side of the Hamiltonian. And those integrals that appeared on the right-hand side, and we took them on the left-hand side, um, afterwards we call uh, overlap integrals. So now using those letters, alpha, beta, and S, this determinant can be very simply written as, uh, or we obtain the, uh, the equation which, uh, which corresponds to the zero determinant, which then provides us with two solutions. Two solutions for the energy, E plus and E minus. So out of those, we will get a state with higher energy and a state with lower energy. <clears throat> Finally, when we are trying to uh, find the solution, we then uh, would see that from the symmetry of the problem, there is a certain relationship between those two coefficients, C A and C B. So they are either with identical numbers or they are uh, anti-symmetrical. They have the opposite sign, but the same absolute value. And putting all of this together, together with the final requirement that each of those states, which corresponds either to the uh, bonding interaction, which yields the lower energy or the anti-bonding, which would yield the higher energy. Uh, so uh, each of those states should correspond to one electron. So we get the final normalization function uh, that the normalization is equal to one, out of which we get a relation between the value of the constant CA and also, of course, then CB and the overlap integral S. Right? So the overlap integral eventually quantifies how far are our two uh, cores. If the cores are far away, then the overlap integral, which is once again S equal A over B, which is an integral of P phi I star times phi B over the whole volume. So if those two cores are far away, we know that the functions might look something like this around the core, where the core sits here. Uh, then the overlapping integral is going to be close to zero. Well, if they are close to zero, then both of these solutions that we obtained are identical with CA plus and minus are the same. We would also see from here that the, uh, the uh, energies that we will obtain will be identical and eventually will end up in a solution that the electron sits either on atom A or core A or on the core B. Only when we put the cores close together and we get the second core and we try it with a different color, we get it somewhere here, we have the second solution of this form and there starts to be a non-zero overlap. A new phenomena arises and the electron might appear not to be on A or only B, but somehow to be in between or to be shared or to jump from one core to the other core and eventually lead to a binding 
between these two poles. The energetics that I have just described lead to this energy level diagram in which we have the energy of isolated hydrogen one estate. So isolated atom one estate has a certain energy. Uh, the another hydrogen atom, isolated atom again, atom B has the identical energy. Of course, it's the same atom, the same situation, just located at a different, um, at a different position. Now, when we put those two pores close together, they form the antibonding orbital. So they form a state that this electron can occupy and has even lower energy than to be on either A or B. We call this the bonding orbital. Then this will indeed lead to formation of the bond between these two ions. We can now try to uh, use this to understand the binding between simple homogeneous molecules. For example, now when we go from the H2 plus molecule to H2, so hydrogen molecule, we eventually end up with identical orbitals. So the scheme here is the same. Now we have two electrons, they do not interact. They have to fulfill the Pauli exclusion principle in the sense that each state can be occupied maximum by two electrons with opposite spins. Well, here we are still in a lucky situation because the one electron coming from one hydrogen and from the other hydrogen, they can combine in the anti-parallel spins, both of them located in the bonding orbital. And of course, these two electrons have lower energy than this one and this one, right? So if we say this is energy E0 and this is the energy Eb, so we clearly see that two times E0 is larger than two times Eb, where Eb is the energy level of this bonding orbital. Therefore, there exists a spontaneous driving force for forming these orbitals forming the overlap between the uh, 1s electrons and therefore leading to a formation of H2 molecule out of two uh, isolated hydrogen atoms when placed close enough. We can use the same scheme also to understand or at least get some uh, intuitive uh, understanding why helium doesn't form any molecule, why there is no helium-2 molecule. Well, simply each helium brings two 1s electrons. And so two helium atoms bring four electrons. However, in the 1s or one, one sigma orbital, I can put maximum two electrons then I have to start occupying the antibonding orbitals, those with the higher energy. It turns out in this particular case that the energy gain with the bonding orbital is smaller than the energy disadvantage of populating the antibonding orbital. So, of course, then if we say this is delta minus, this would be called delta plus, then, and this is energy level E0, so four times energy E0, on one hand side, this would be the two isolated atoms, or we have two times E0 minus delta minus plus two E0 plus delta plus, would lead to the fact that since this part is larger than that, we will get that this is larger, the right-hand side energy is larger than the left-hand side. And the energy preference is for two isolated atoms instead of 
forming a hypothetical helium-2 molecule. All right. Similar schemes can be then used to other molecules and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is nevertheless uh, basic chemistry and I will skip this and rather go to what is important for us, physics treatment, the type binding method. We start from the same starting point. We start from an isolated atom. So isolated atom is described by an atomic Hamiltonian. This HA describes one single atom. And the solutions corresponding to this one single atom are the atomic orbitals. So to this end, it is identical with what we had in the LCAO method. We see that each of them also corresponds to exactly one electron, so they are normalized. What we now create is that we superpose those atomic Hamiltonians. It means that we now place these Hamiltonians on the individual lattice sides and simply sum over them, right? So when you think about the potential well, and now you have the atomic crystal structure, we put this potential well at each of those positions and we sum up over them. What is the property of such superposed Hamiltonian, which we will call uh, now the superposed atomic Hamiltonian? Well, when we come close to an atomic side or crystalline side, then eventually, and here we have typo, here we should have that the AAT equals to HA. So eventually this Hamiltonian, the superposition, will become pretty much identical with an isolated atom. That means that as soon as we come to a vicinity of an atom, electron stops seeing the surrounding atom, stops seeing the crystalline structure. Therefore, we can describe the uh, total wave function corresponding to this one electron in the crystalline potential. We can describe it by a superposition of orbitals which are well localized. And those are the atomic orbitals, exactly in the analogy of the LCAO method. Because of this uh, strong interaction of the Hamiltonian, uh, the, sorry, the strong interaction between the electron and the uh, atomic potential, this localization, we expect that such a superposition states is going to be a very reasonable approximation to our real crystalline delocalized but not too delocalized state. So we define our solution or we are looking for a solution that will be in the form of Bloch function and that will have this form. So we take here the individual orbitals, localize them at all atomic sides, exactly as we did it in uh, for, for the two atomic H2 plus molecule, where we localize the one state at one and the other uh, atom. And on top of that, we put here a certain prefactor. This prefactor is there in order to fulfill the Bloch's theorem. Hopefully you remember what the Bloch's theorem is. This is what we based our solutions uh, already in the nearly uh, free electron method on. The Bloch's theorem says for crystalline potential, for lattice-peridic potential, all the solutions 
of the Schrodinger equation with such potential should be in the form of plane wave times a lattice periodic function. All right, so this is a lattice periodic function. This is what we used last week also then to uh, do the nearly free electron treatment, which allowed us to do this. Uh, a consequence of this block theorem and searching for wave functions in this form is the wave function fulfills when I move by one lattice vector, the wave function changes by the plane wave prefactor or by the plane wave phase. Right. So now this is our solution and that this relation holds is, let's say, a consequence of the Bloch's theorem or can be also treated as another definition of the Bloch's state. Right. The capital R here is the lattice vector. It is simple to show that if we define our wave function as such linear combination of the atomic orbitals, that it fulfills the Bloch's function. I leave this for you, probably put it as one of your uh, homework tasks that you can show, that you can prove this. So when we now know in which form we are looking for the solution, again, in a simple form written here, we see that this is a superposition of the individual atomic orbitals. By J, we label the states, one S state, two S state, two P state, and so on. By capital R, we label at which atomic side is this orbital located? Essentially, this is a short notice or short uh, shortcut for uh, for writing this function phi j as really the functional form of the orbital. We multiply them by the plane wave, sum over all of these exactly the same way as we did in the LC. Right. So let's come now to a real crystalline potential and real crystalline Schrodinger equation. It looks the same as what we had before with the one difference that the Hamiltonian H is now not the superposition of the atomic Hamiltonians as on the previous slide, but this is now really the full crystalline potential. That means that we have there all interactions included that are necessary for the description. Right. When we do this, we can express what is the difference between this full crystalline Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian that we had on the previous slide, this superposition of the atomic Hamiltonians. And most importantly, we will have here that now there is an uh, interaction between a state on a certain atom with the cores located at different positions. This is what is hidden in this delta U, in this potential in this difference uh, between the superposition of atomic Hamiltonians and the full crystalline Hamiltonian, right? So eventually in this superposition of atomic Hamiltonians, if I had a state J R, it interacted in principle only with Hamiltonian H A located at the position R. If I would take another Hamiltonian, J, uh, 
uh, sorry, 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 sorry. I take Hamiltonian, which is located at a different side, R prime, and let it act on the state which corresponds to the state R. This will be equal to zero, right? So the individual orbitals do not interact with other cores. But of course, this is not true in real crystal. One electron will be strongly attracted to its nearest core, but will most likely see also the other cores. Well, once again, why? Because it uh, forms bonds, it forms the crystal. It is not a collection of isolated atoms. So this interaction with the neighboring cores, with the neighboring atoms, is included in this delta U potential. We assume the solutions still in the form of what we had before. So in the superposition of the uh, individual ionic, uh, individual orbitals localized at different cores. When we do this, we'll end up with a band structure. It means with the energy levels corresponding to a certain K vector uh, in the form that we have here, which includes apart from the isolated energy levels and the uh, correction, the first or zeroth transfer integral. It also, as we see here, includes the interactions between uh, the more distant orbitals via the crystalline uh, via the crystalline uh, cores. So for example, how a state on one core corresponding to one core uh, might actually sort of interact with itself via a neighboring core. This is included in the beta integral or how it may interact with a state localized on a different core. Such integrals, if we put here the H A T, such integrals are zero because once again, uh, the uh, transfer integrals in the case of the superposition of atomic uh, Hamiltonians are equal to zero. What does this mean? If we now uh, make the analogy with the LCAO method, when we had the two atoms, the two cores, which started interacting, they led to a following situation. From a single energy level, they split into bonding and antibonding state. We have now three atoms instead of two atoms. We obtain splitting into three different levels. For an interaction of four atoms, we get four energy levels. In the tight binding method, when we are in solid state physics, so we have infinitely large, perfectly crystalline, perfectly periodic crystals, we obtain infinite many atoms, and the splitting is into infinite many levels, which are infinitesimally close. Yeah, filling a whole range of energies that we will now call bands. So the cause of the interaction of electrons with neighboring atoms, the sharp energy levels that we know from isolated atoms, uh, we know this as the ionization energies of isolated atoms, they become spread in the continuous range of energies. We call those energies bands. And those form the bands of allowed uh, energies for the states in the solid state. Those are eventually the same bands as we described last week when we had the splitting 
near to the drilling zone boundary. We obtained somewhere here a band of energies which were all allowed. So for each of these energies, I would find a state which corresponds to such energy. At the same time, I had a band of states where no energy, where no states uh, could be assigned to this energy. I had the band of forbidden energies or band gap in my uh, electronic band structure. And again, if you look at how we arrived at such picture last week, we started from the free electron model where there were no bands right? or there were no band gaps. So eventually all energies could be assigned to a certain state. This is exactly what the free electron model does. The energy dispersion relationship there is that E equals H bar squared K squared over 2M. So for each uh, energy, I can find corresponding K vector, which describes the state of an electron. If we say now this is the nearly free electrons, which now bring a similar picture as the tight binding, but the tight binding also says we have a band of energies. That's fine. And here, how did we arrive here? We came from isolated atoms, which had just single energy level. So as soon as I take the atoms far away from each other, that means that I do see only one atom and I do not interact with any other atoms. My energy levels degenerate to a discrete set of values that is here. I bring the atoms closer together, the energy levels start splitting and filling band of energies. This is the transition towards the tight binding model. Now this tight binding model brings the same picture as the nearly free electron model, right? For sufficiently weak tight binding interaction for sufficiently strong nearly free electrons, all right? So it's somewhere between. When I now sort of start uh, putting the atoms closer to, to each other, or in better words, I start uh, diminishing the discreteness of localization of atomic cores. And the atomic cores become localized evenly everywhere in the space. I end up with eventually the homogeneous, nearly, uh, the, the homogeneous free electron model. Right? The electrons, they would be bound, but there would be no spatial distribution of the, uh, of the positive ionic potential. From what I said, from bringing these uh, atoms together, we can see that somehow the transfer integral which is related to how really spatially the individual or isolated atomic orbitals overlap. Uh, this will be a measure of the bandwidth. The further apart are the atoms, the smaller is the overlap and therefore more Isolated atom-like, the bands will be, the more flat the bands will be. So the smaller will be the bandwidth. The narrower would be the bands. With the uh, limiting case that I isolate the atoms to infinity and my finite bandwidth will degenerate a single energy line. Consequently, since the bandwidth 
is related to the spatial uh, distribution of the atoms. Also, the bandwidth can be related with the crystalline structure and with the arrangement of atoms. So as we uh, have written here, if the atoms are in a certain relate in a certain direction are further apart, then the bandwidth will be small. The flat the, the bands will be almost flat. If you have very closely packed up closely packed atoms, the splitting uh, or the spreading of the energies will be larger and the band will be thicker. We can demonstrate this on a group four elements. You look at the periodic table. In the group four, we have carbon below sitting silicon, below sitting germanium, and below steel. All of them have the same valence configuration. And they all lead to a different lattice constants. So if we now think that Basically, they have the same uh, valence configuration, which would lead to the same formation of the uh, hybridized orbitals, the same molecular orbitals, or this uh, linear combination of atomic orbitals leads to the same bonding and antibonding states qualitatively. Then by putting more and more atoms, really, um, having not a pair of atoms, but having now a whole crystal, infinitely large crystal, leads to spreading the energy level into a whole band, which first those bands start splitting. So the S band starts splitting, the P band starts splitting. As I'm bringing the atoms closer from a large distance, these would be isolated atoms. I bring them closer. They start splitting. At certain point, they start interacting, forming the hybridized orbitals, and therefore splitting into bonding and antibonding orbitals. Those will, at the beginning, they will overlap. But later on, they will start splitting further and further apart, forming a band gap. And since all of those species have exactly four valence electrons, they will exactly fill the bonding orbital. It means I will have all those states filled and all those states will be unoccupied, unfilled. It means that if I want to excite an electron, I want to uh, force the material to become conductor, to conduct an electric charge. I need to excite the electron to the nearest unoccupied state, which is localized far away. And this is qualitatively why the uh, materials will become semiconductors. If I now increase the lattice spacing and I move here, I might enter a state where there is no separation between the valence and conduction band, which means that if I have those states occupied, the nearest unoccupied state is just above. It does not cost me almost any energy to excite the electron and to make it a conduction, conducting electron. So in this case, in this range, I will obtain metallic behavior. Now, if you look at this table that we have on the right-hand side here, we compare that when we go from carbon, represented in the diamond structure, over silicon, germanium to tin, we increase the lattice constant significantly from 3.5 angstrom to 6.5 angstrom. And indeed, we come from a range of wide band gap to a small band gap and to eventually even a metallic behavior of tin. 
So these arguments that we have brought up here, the understanding and the insight, allows you qualitatively to understand a behavior of different classes of materials spanning from semiconductors to metals, the relationship between those materials, material classes, then their crystalline structure, the size of the lattice constant. Potentially, you would expect, for example, that application of pressure means making the lattice constant smaller, might, in the case of tin, shift it in the range when it would become a semiconductor. So you might have this metal semiconductor transition. And all of this is based on relatively simple qualitative arguments of how are we building the band structure, the description of the electronic uh, wave function of an infinitely large periodic crystal out of our single uh, atomic orbitals. And that brings me to the end of today's lecture, in which we introduced the tight binding method as a physics equivalent for the chemistry localized uh, linear combination of atomic orbitals. Uh, we described terms such as Coulombic or resonance integrals and um, very importantly, the overlap integrals, which describe how the orbitals localized at different ionic cores, how do they overlap? So they indeed correspond with the size of your crystalline structure with the lattice parameter. In terms of isolated molecules, this led to a formation of bonding and antibonding states, which further on by increasing the number of atoms would lead to a formation of the whole band. So you would have a whole band of bonding and whole band of antibonding states. Um, those might or might not overlap really depending on the individual values of the uh, resonance Coulombic and overlap integrals. In the tight binding method, we, uh, we, we followed the same route. Eventually, we created the atomic uh, Hamiltonian, which was an overlap of the or superposition of the isolated atomic Hamiltonians. And then we added the perturbation corresponding to the difference between the superposition and the real crystalline Hamiltonian, which led again to the definition of the transfer integrals, which allow us to reconstruct the crystalline band structure out of the single atomic, uh, single atomic values, eigenvalues and eigenvalues. And at the very end, we briefly discussed the formation of bands. Again, now coming from the isolated single values towards the band structure as a counterpart of the a nearly free electron model where we came from eventually one end uh, of energies where all energies are accessible and by switching on the potential we then started forming the band gaps so now we come from the other side where essentially we have just a few discrete values of energies and by switching off or or weakening the interaction between electrons and the corresponding core we uh, start splitting these uh, single valued energy levels into the bands. And uh, uh, therefore, we create a discrete bands, each band co uh, containing a continuum of energy levels accessible.